to welcome everybody tonight to our chance to listen to and ask questions of NASCAR Xfinity racer Ryan Vargas. My name is Chris Gurney. In case you don't know me, I'm the Executive Director of the Midwest Dream Car Collection here. And I'm very grateful and pleased you all came out to hear him. We've been really impressed. He's, a, he's an awesome person and an awesome example of, of the sporting world and a great example to people. Just a little bit of background. Ryan is a Wendell Scott Trailblazer Award winner and also a NASCAR Superstock Rookie of the Year Award winner. He has an incredible story of, of how he's gotten to where he is as a professional racer today, and I think you're going to learn a lot from him. So with that, Mr. Ryan Vargas. Thank you for inflating my head. Uh, but hi, uh, it's nice to meet all you guys. Um, I, I'm, I, I really appreciate all you guys coming out here tonight. Um, the, Doug, everybody here at the museum, uh, thank you to you guys for putting this on. Um, definitely very excited to finally, finally work with you guys. I actually reached out to these guys for the first time like a year and a half ago. Um, so it's cool to finally have it all come together like this. Um, but uh, as, as Chris said, uh, my name is Ryan Vargas. I'm originally from the state of California. I'm originally from LA County, uh, La Mirada, California. Um, I got into racing um, a little bit of an unorthodox way. Um, I used to wake up crack of dawn every morning to watch monster trucks, off-road, NASCAR, sports car racing, anything with four wheels and a motor I really loved. And I tried every sport, whether it was baseball, soccer, football, basketball, you name it, I tried it. I, and if you didn't know, they, there actually is a position that all sport has, every one of those sports has, that goes with every one of them and it's bench. I was that. Um, I hated it. I was so bored. And my dad finally said, you know, let me take you to, to Irwindale, which is my local short track. And we go out there and we see little bandolero cars. And if you, uh, uh, I wish I prepared a little bit more of something to show you guys, but bandolero cars are a little small third scale uh, race cars that kids age, starting at the age of eight can race. Um, and I see them and I see a worker from my school there. Um, and from talking to her, she says, yeah, my son's racing and, uh, you know, we're actually trying to sell this car. So my eyes immediately gravitated to my dad. Um, so long story short about the car. And uh, we ended up racing that for about three years. Uh, won the California State Championship all three of those years. Won over 70 races in that race car. Um, and through that, I've been able to move up. Um, through the ranks, ran a uh, 1973 Chevy Camaro NASCAR street stock when I was 14 years old and I was the youngest in that division by 10 years roughly. Um, and that was a sketchy experience because the guys who I was racing against were as old as my dad. Um, but we all got along really well. I mean, I, I made sure I didn't hit nobody and run into nobody. That's the quickest way to lose respect is by hitting people. And I tried to not do that. Um, ran that and that same the same night I won my first street stock race, I ended up landing a deal to go race um, NASCAR super late models and late models. Um, and for those who don't know, those are the kind of the highest local level of racing, stock car racing at your local short tracks. Um, through that, you know, ran a couple races, won a handful, uh, was recognized as stated back there. I uh, was actually part of the, I, I won the, NAS, the NASCAR Wendell Scott Trailblazer Award. Uh, Wendell Scott is the first uh, African-American driver to win in a, a NASCAR stock car, uh, win a NASCAR Cup Series event. Uh, so that award is awarded to a um, uh, minority or female driver in the NASCAR wheel End series. And I won that two years in a row, uh, being the highest ranked um, in that series out of 400 drivers, I think it is. So that was pretty neat. Um, when I was 17, I landed an opportunity to race in the ARCA series, moved across country, Moved to North Carolina when I was 17 years old, packed up all my stuff. Um, my dad and I stayed there for a few months and once I got settled, he went back home and I was 17 years old living in an apartment using race winnings to pay for rent. And that was a experience, but that was, it taught me a lot about just how to get better as a person to, yeah, to get better as a person in the business, you know, learning how to sell, sell myself for sponsorship, how, how to, find money to go drive race cars. Um, once my ARCA ride fizzled out, I was 18 years old and washed up. 
So I had to learn how to sell races, how to market myself, how to be a, a, pre a pre prevalent person in the sport without, you know, having a name. Um, and, you know, through meeting some incredible people, through learning how to be more active on social media um, and, you know, just being the squeaky wheel, I like to say, when it comes to marketing, um, you know, has led me to where I am today, racing in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, which is the second highest uh, level in NASCAR, which is crazy to say, um, but here I am today. And uh, it's a pleasure to meet all you guys. It's a pleasure to f sign a lot of autographs. It's great to see all you guys. And um, if you guys have any questions, uh, like, feel free. I'm, I'm willing to just kind of open this up. I, I, you know, if there's anything you guys have that you guys are curious of, Doug? Tell us about your race this weekend, Ryan. What's all involved with preparing for that and all your races you go to um, and then the day of the race, how it all takes place? Yeah, um, so I'll just kind of go into like, so my average week essentially looks like I'll go to the shop Monday, help work on the car, help tear down the car from the week prior. If there's any damage, I'll help replace the fenders, help take off, you know, any of the parts. Or if there's, you know, no need for me to help on the car, they're like, hey, we got it. You know, you go do what you need to do. I'll go do marketing. I'll go do phone calls, cold calls, all that other uh, fancy stuff to basically find the money to race. Um, and that's essentially my week leading up to it. Uh, once we get to the track, uh, a lot of the day is pushing through tech, tech inspection, uh, what NASCAR does. They'll check, you know, obviously the car, make sure it's up to their specs in their rule book, uh, as well as their safety guidelines and all of that stuff to make sure I'm not going out there with unsafe race equipment. Um, and race day comes along and my first task is to wake up for the alarm. And if I do that, then I think we're pretty good. Um, get to the track, you know, hang out, hang out with the guys, talk about the race, talk about what we think we're gonna do, um, analyze our situation for the race, where we're starting, what we gotta do, how we gotta improve, how we can, you know, use pit strategy to better our performance, or how I check out my notes from other stuff. That's another thing is note taking, uh, watching a lot of footage, doing a lot of i racing sim laps. Um, it's a it's a big learning process to get behind the wheel um the, all the stuff that goes into getting behind the wheel on friday practice because that's really what you need to do you need to make sure you're completely prepped and ready um so i'm leaving here tonight and i'm going to go to my hotel room and put on last year's race and fall asleep to that <laughs> but that's about that's about how i prepare and a lot of hydration um about your early career when you're starting out and you're moving up the different cars. Do you own your own car? Do you take care of your own car? Or do you have a team? Yeah, um, so when I started racing, it was our own car. We operated out of my our, out of our single car garage in California. Um, we had two Bandolero cars. Um, we bought, uh, the first one we bought for three grand, and then the second car we bought for $2,100, and it was in the back alley in, in downtown LA. Literally in a back alley. I kid you not. We take that car um, and we buy it because A, it was cheap. And we were gonna actually use it as a backup car. We weren't even gonna use it as like a main car that we had. And the funny story about this is they tell us like, no, this car's good, we promise. It just needs to be, it just needs to be fluffed and buffed. And we're like, okay. So we take it, you know, go through it, put it back together, go to Las Vegas Motor Speedway Bullring. Qualified on pole by two tenths and we won the race with that car that was found in an alleyway. Um, so that quickly became our primary car um, and we ended up selling both of those cars for six grand a piece so we doubled doubled one car and um, more than doubled the other um, and you know all that stuff when you move up the ranks like I mentioned NASCAR street stock we operated that of our out of our garage as well my late model we operated that out of our garage um, it's kind of unique and I like to go talk a little bit about this story because um, in 2017, before I made that jump to the North Carolina, I remember my parents and I sitting down, and, and, I'll, and I'll mention, my, my mom's like a first grade teacher. My dad is a construction worker. We're heavily middle class. We're not any, you know, a lot of people who get into racing, they either have, you know, a lot of funding behind them or all that stuff. And that's no, not a bad thing by any means. If I were in their position, I'd be doing the same thing. <laughs> but uh, uh, my parents sit me down and they say, you know, after this year, we're done. They said, we're done driving. You know, we can't, you know, afford it. And I personally have seen friends of mine lose their house for racing because they have this passion that they don't want to lose. 
and, it, and they are willing to lose everything about it. And I learned, I, I'm thankful that I learned at a very young age, 15, 16, 17, that I was not gonna let myself or my family do that. And when they sat, they sat me down and said, we can't do this anymore, like we're gonna have to sell the car, I said, cool, you know, let's do it, I'll go to school, whatever, I'll finish this out. It just so happened a month later, I got a call from Rev Racing out in North Carolina for the ARCA program, and I landed that ride. Um, I went and did a combine, did a physical test, on-track assessment, and media assessment, so where I speak into a mic and talk to basically this. Um, and, uh, you know, we aced all that, and I ended up landing the ride. And that extended my career one year. Um, and since then, it's just, you know, finding new places, new, new rides. I've been fortunate to kind of have found a home at JD Motorsports for the last few years. Um, made a few one-off starts for my Carmen racing. Um, so once you get up into this level, you start racing for team owners and it becomes a business venture, you know, a business relationship uh, more than just being on a team. Do you mind if I ask how old are you now? I'm 21. Uh, I, turn, I, I was born September 23rd, 2000. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. How many crew, er, good crew members do you have on your team? So on my car, I have my crew chief, Case, my uh, car chief, Bird, um, tire guy, Gabe, um, engineer, Spud, um, and that's about it. Um, and, then I, and then it's me. Um, I'll help with whatever I can. Um, at the track, um, obviously we have our pit crew guys. They are separate from our um, garage mechanics and stuff like that. Um, they, something that you might not know about racing is a lot of these um, pit crew guys are, um, I guess you could say you, you rent their, their services. So a lot of these pit crew guys, like if you have, like for example, whenever we have a really big sponsor, like a, a huge race for us, we ran a Hendrick pit crew, but this like on other races where you know you don't have that, you know you go for the lower end, you know pit crew guys. Heck, sometimes even my my car, my car chief bird will go over the wall and change a tire, um, but it it varies. Pit crew varies, but my regular on the car crew stays the same all the year. How many people are in an actual pit crew then that you rent? I think it's five or six. I believe it's five or six. I know it's um, two changers, jack man, fuel man, and then driver service. So driver service, driver service, they take a tear off off the windshield, hand you a, ba hand you a bag of ice or a, bag or a water bottle, whatever you need. It gets hot in those race cars. Um, that, that role is so criminally underrated. Um, we uh, ran Nashville the other, uh, about a month ago, two months ago. It was 102 degrees out and really humid. And inside the cars, I think the highest they saw was like 139.4. And we don't have AC. We don't run any AC units at all in, in race cars. So the only real air we get is to our helmet. And even then, it's really at room temp. Um, and so you got to think, you cook a medium rare steak to 135 to 140. <laughs> so what I'm getting at is we get out of that car a perfect medium rare after the race, <laughs> if you really want to think about it. But yeah. What was your top speed? Fastest I've gone, I, I, I know it, it's kind of mixed. It's hard to get accurate data. From what I understand, the fastest I've gone is 198. Um, from what I understand. Um, the most accurate data I got was at Auto Club Speedway this year. They have a little, they have a giant billboard screen that says how fast the car is going in a turn one. And we were qualifying and all the cars that qualified good hit 194. So I was like going down the straightaway for my qualifying lap and I'm like, I keep seeing the ticker saying like 189, 190, 191. And I'm like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Finally hit 194, I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading the sign going, it, going that fast. That probably wasn't the best idea. <laughs> how many of the speedways, major speedways have you driven on? At this point, um, all of them really except for Indy, Indianapolis. Um, that's one that I really want to race uh, in next year, hopefully. Um, Daytona. Love Daytona. I, 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 so the crazy thing about speedway racing, um, Daytona and Talladega, with them being 2.5 mile ovals, 
you got to think with our cars if they didn't restrict us we'd be hitting 240 miles an hour going into those corners so to combat that they restrict us um because of that that leads to us driving in really really big thick packs of 20 30 40 cars in one group and it leads to a lot of destruction um, so some of the things that we do, my, I have this joke that I say to a lot of my buddies whenever we go to these speedway races and I tell them, I say, um, the word of the week is vibe. Um, I'm going to simply do nothing and hope for the best. And so we ran Daytona. I ran 35th all day, intentionally. And we ended up finishing sixth. So my best finish of my career, we did, I did the least effort. <laughs> Do you prefer ovals or road courses? I prefer ovals, but road courses are the most fun, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah, I, I, I love... I, they're, they're a lot of work. They're a lot of work. Uh, my favorite road course is Road America. That was where I made my second ever Xfinity Series start, and this goes also back to vibing. Um, I remember I ran, that was my second start and my job was to finish the race. That was my only job. They didn't care if I finished last or won the thing. I had to finish. Like not, no damage on the car. Cause I got, I got the talk from my car owner saying we need to use this car in Charlotte. And I'm like, okay, uh, I'm scared. Um, so I'm lining up like 14th on a restart, which is pretty high up there. And, and I get told, let's back off. Let's go to the back. I'm like, okay. So I go to the back. Final restart happens and it's just, car goes off, car goes off, passing a car, car goes off, car goes off. These guys wrecked, oh God, they're going, they're here. This car's in the, this guy's in the sand. And then <laughs> I remember keying up after race. I was like, oh my God, I wish we could have got a better finish, but, but thank you. And my crew chief says, what are you talking about? You finished 18th. <laughs> and I was like, cool, I'll take that. <laughs> so. Uh, you mentioned the, um, uh from the helmets. Do you guys have wetsuits like cup series drivers? So I can run that. I, I could. But the problem is, is one, they cost a lot of money and I have to worry about rent. Uh, but also two, um, I, I'm still very skittish on them. They have a very large tendency still. They, they haven't worked the kinks out of them. Let's just put it that way. They, and when they malfunction, it's not like they malfunction, they just turn off, like they're not working. No, if they malfunction, they're not just not working, they're doing the opposite effect and actually pumping hot water onto you. So it's doing the opposite effect of cooling. It's not like it's just like off, it's actually doing, it's actively making it worse. <laughs> um, so I could do it, but once it's a little more proven, I'm gonna do it. So, so racing is a pretty high uh, risk. So what is the incidence of injuries or even worse, mortality? So thankfully NASCAR has a very good safety record of we haven't had a passing since Dale Earnhardt, thankfully. Um, and you know, injuries do happen. Uh, in fact, my roommate, my roommate, believe it or not, I race against him. Um, he flipped into the catch fence at Daytona going 190 miles an hour. Um, that car had the engine, transmission, fuel cell, everything ripped out of it except for the driver, basically the cockpit. It was only a center section that was left of that race car. He got out of it. He walked away. Um, and that was the first time I was ever concerned about someone's safety. Um, that being said, the likeliness of in injury varies depending on you know the type of hit the equipment you use. Um, I mean, obviously one of the big glaring things right now, Kurt Busch is out with a concussion this season. Um, he backed into a wall going 160, 170 and just hit it the right way. Because your first instinct when you back and you're backing towards a wall, you tense up, you do this. But you, sh what, you know, what in reality, if he would have had his head back, you don't have that impact hitting the back of your seat. But every driver does it. I've done it. I've done that. Like, oh God, and then tensed up and hit my head. Um, so it's it's possible. It's something that is very real. It's a, still a very real risk. And NASCAR does a really good job addressing any safety issues that come up. Like they've been dissecting that Kurt Busch hit to every minute detail so that we don't have more drivers having concussions. What's, what's the worst wreck you've been in so far? Actually, it was this year. Um, it was Las Vegas. Um, I was 
running 18th, 19th at the time. We were, we were playing a really good strategy. Um, caught a car that was a s several laps down. And he spun out right in front of me. And I was like, great, I'm, I'm in it. Well, when, I hit, when he spun out, I had nowhere to go. I got into him, but the car behind me was also me and him were battling for a position. So he's right behind me. So I, you know, suddenly I stop, movable object, movement. Go, he goes underneath me, lifts me up into the air. So now we're sliding towards the wall going probably still 140, 150. And so you think that impact was big, but it didn't do anything to me. I felt fine. The real impact was when I tank slapped the wall, still carrying all the speed I had because I basically, none of my tires were on the ground until I hit the wall. So I didn't have any way to shed that speed, I guess you could say. There was no friction of the tires slowing me down. It was simply me just sliding on sheet metal because I was on top of a car. Um, and fortunately, I was okay. Fortunately, everybody was okay. Fortunately, the car was um, fixable. And actually, that's the same car I'm using tomorrow. <laughs> where, where are you going to be tomorrow? Kansas Speedway. Um, this this weekend we're racing at Kansas Speedway um, over by Kansas City, Kansas. So, okay. um, how do you get from place to place? Do you have a rig? Do you have a, a mobile, uh, like a bus, or how do you guys travel from one place to the other and get your car from? You know, what's your rig like? Yeah, so we have you know just regular you know uh, racing haulers. It's a stacker hauler. Um, we're able to store two cars up top, and then we have all of our equipment down down below. Um, and that's, uh, you know, just a regular semi-toter and stuff like that. Uh, we, as a team, will either do one of two things. We'll ride in a team van. We have two team vans that we hop in. We all get all cozy next to each other. And we ride to the track that's, you know, if it's within, you know, five, six, seven, eight hours. Um, if it's any further than that, most likely we'll fly. Uh, what a lot of teams do, and a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of teams do charter flights um, through either Champion Air or Victory. Um, and we all... You know, all the teams pitch in. We all get you know seats on this charter flight, and so we're actually doing it after this race at Kansas this this weekend. So once our flight, I mean, sorry, once our race ends on Saturday, we load all our stuff up. Once our stuff's loaded up, we go straight to the airport and we go to the runway. We show them our license, and then we hop on the plane. No, like there's, it's just simple, easy, quick. You're out of there almost instantly. And, and it's crew that's going to drive your vehicles to your next place. Uh, they drive them back to the shop. They drive them back to our race shop, and so we'll take them, take them home. You know, obviously turn them around for the next race, whether we're using that same car or a different car, um, and then we'll no normally load up and leave Wednesday, Thursday, depending on the distance. Um, if it's out west, we'll leave on Tuesday. Is this a playoffs or just the race? Yeah, this is a play. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. Uh, for the Cup Series, it's a playoffs race. Uh, for us, we still have this weekend and next weekend before the playoffs. And then I have another question. Yeah. On your inspection, you said earlier, do you have to get out and they check the cockpit? Like when they, like during inspection, like, yeah. so what they'll do is they have, there's several stations in NASCAR tech. Um, there's obviously just general safety inspection. So that's where they inspect the dates on your safety equipment when they expire. Um, every piece of safety equipment has a certain amount of time before they expire and need to be either rebuilt, resealed, or whatever. Um, so we have obviously that. They'll check our window net, check our seat belts, check our head headrests. Uh, if you ever look at the interior of a, na a modern day NASCAR stock car, um, the headrests are literally leaning against our helmets. Sometimes we even have extra padding so we're like this so we don't have to do work because we're lazy. Um, they check that a lot, especially now after, the, like I'm, as I mentioned before, the Kurt Busch incident. Um, they're actually adding more padding to the back of our seat because of that. They don't want us tensing up too much and getting that whiplash effect. So is that padding you said like memory foam? It's a certain type of foam. Um, it's, it's one of those types of foam that's meant to take hard and quick impacts. Um, and it's not like, like you like the seat the seats that you're sitting on today. They have those cushions. They're, the the padding is harder than that, so it's still gonna hurt you when you hit it. But if you were to hit your head on that going 100 something miles an hour, it that would do more damage versus the seat padding that we have in the car, which is inherently more stiff. It's a weird logic thing. I learned it. I don't get it still, but. <laughs>
how do you keep your nerves under control? Do you do breathing techniques or? So, I mean, a lot of drivers will like say, oh yeah, I don't get nervous. And if they're saying they don't get nervous, they're lying to you. Um, every driver gets nervous. I get nervous. Heck, I get, I'm a chronic overthinker. Um, but, you know, it's about how you combat that. You know, for me, I, I don't really get so nervous to the point where I'm like tensed out or anything. I mean, I was just talking earlier. If I'm by a race, if I'm getting ready to get into the race car, I'm sleepy. I'm ready to take a nap. That's how I get, that's how I calm myself down is get myself sleepy. Um, you're very nerved up, you're very anxious, but once I get into a car, once I get into the car, the motor started and we're rolling off a pit road for the race, it's forgotten. You're, you're very, exactly, adrenaline. You, you forget all about those nerves because now you're focused on the task at hand versus how do I do the task at hand. Yeah, like for, but the best way to explain it, if you ride a bike, you don't think about riding a bike. You don't actively think about the task of riding a bike. You just do it. Same thing with driving a race car. You spend all the time outside of the car thinking, how do I do this? How do I drive the car? And then you drive the car and you're like, oh, that's how I do it. There's obviously a certain number of races that you can run and, and try to improve your skills. How do you work on improving your skills outside of that race setting in a way that it translates it's really going to work for you real time going 150 miles an hour? Yeah, so one of the more popular things nowadays is a, an I, is a simulating simulation platform called iRacing. Um, you can buy your own wheel and pedals for your own computer at home. You could actually buy a subscription to iRacing. Um, I used iRacing as a platform to get my visual, it's a visual aid for me. Uh, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are still very hesitant on the effects of using iRacing. I don't use it to try and drive better. I use it so that I know what's around me. Like I do, I'll get on there, like just exa for an example, this week I did well over 150, 200 laps practicing for this weekend. And that's on the light side, um, just because I had to leave to come here Wednesday. Um, I'll do hundreds and hundreds of laps just to get used to, okay, here's where that tree's at. Here's where this light is at. Okay, this is what it looks like when I'm passing somebody. Okay, now I'm in a pack of 18 cars. This is what it normally looks like. And it kind of gets me into that, move, into that mood. And another thing that I do do, that I've started doing recently, is I've started doing pit stop practice um, with the team at Hendrick. Um, I've been fortunate to have an opportunity to go do that. And what essentially you do is you drive a pit school, pit, a pit practice car. It's basically a, a out of commission cup car. Um, you go around and those guys who are doing pit stops, they have to practice throughout the week to stay good, to stay agile. So they need someone to drive those cars. So I'll go and do that. I'll volunteer and go drive the cars for an hour. Um, and it gets me in the mental state of, okay, I'm driving a race car. I'm sliding into the box. I'm doing a pit stop. So that's something that I do. Now, uh, now do you have to wear a heartbeat monitor? I don't have to. A lot of drivers. They require. Yeah, they don't require any of that stuff. Um, one of the things that they do um, a lot is if you get involved in an accident. Um, they'll obviously hook you up to a heart monitor and stuff like that to make sure you're not going into any sort of you know episode um, but also they'll do a concussion test and that concussion test is something that you do at the beginning of the year it's like a series of puzzles this is how they do concussion, concussion tests in the infield care center it's a series of puzzles they time you on how quick you do them and they don't you don't just do it once you do it like three or four times and then they take your average time when you go into the info care center after an accident, you get presented those exact same puzzles and you do them that same amount of time. And if you're varying five, 10 seconds off, either way, no big deal. But if you're a minute or more or just around there, that's when they're like, okay, we need to take you to the hospital. So uh, to race in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, you do need a NASCAR Xfinity Series license. You do need to go through 
um, not, not necessarily testing, but you need to have proof of competition, I guess you could say. You need to have X amount of starts on certain types of tracks. Um, so like if you were to go and try and purchase an Xfinity Series license, it would be a very tough time to do it because you have no racing experience. But if you wanted to go buy, if you wanted to go buy a license to go race a NASCAR street stock, like I mentioned that I drove earlier, you can go and do that no problem because there's no tests to go do that. There's no driving tests to go do that. You can essentially buy a, a license yourself without any prior racing experience up to the ARCA short track level. Um, and then once you get to that point, then it's like, okay, you actually have to go run a ARCA short track race and a short track is considered anything under a mile in length. So if you were to go to X short track and go out there and run 14th and not cause an accident, not get yourself in trouble, ARCA will look at that and say, okay, you're approved to run a mile to a mile and a quarter. Then you go run at Dover. And if you don't get an accident there, guess what? You're approved for a mile and a half and so on and so forth. Um, so it's, there, there is a, license requirement once you get to a certain point, but until you get to that point, it's not. Brian, maybe you should explain like the kind of different models of the racetracks and what those mean. Yeah, um, so the Cliff Notes way to explain, explain the NASCAR ladder, um, obviously you have the NASCAR Advanced Auto Parts Weekly Series, which is like as I mentioned before, the street stocks, super late models, late models, that's all under that umbrella. Then you have the ARCA series, which has its varying uh, regional tours. So they have the West, uh, the East, uh, and then they have their main championship. Um, that's the level right there. Then you have the truck series, NASCAR Camping World Truck Series, soon to be NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series. That is the third level of NASCAR Xfinity. That's us, Cup. That's the very top. That's the series you see on Sundays. Um, the different types of tracks include short tracks, which, as I mentioned, are tracks under a mile in length. Um, intermediate tracks are tracks anywhere from 1.1 to, to uh, basically two miles in length. Um, and then you have the super speedways, which are anything over two miles in length. Uh, road courses, which are obviously right and left. Um, and then you all and now now we have street courses. Uh, where we race on actual public roads, um, where they, you know, kind of like IndyCar or Formula One, we are actually going to race at Chicago next year. Um, so that's something that they're doing that's new. And then they've also introduced the uh, dirt track racing where we race on dirt. Um, so there's various types of tracks, various types of series. Um, that's one thing about NASCAR. It's not just one thing like it, you know, people kind of think it is. There is a lot of different types of racing you get within NASCAR. I think I saw you raise your hand or something. Well, I think you kind of answered my question because I was just going to ask if things were standard rides within the Xfinity series, but it sounds like there's a variety of tracks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, the, in our series, you know, another thing too is, like I said, like I mentioned before, where the series just below cup, you know, the series tagline is uh, where names are made. So a lot of our, you know, a lot of drivers are either drivers who have had cup careers and are kind of just like, ah, I want to go race Xfinity and, you know, continue having a racing career without the stress of running in the cup series. And then there's some, and then there's the other half where it's young guys like myself, you know, Ty Gibbs, Sam Mayer, like all these guys who are really young getting into the sport, trying to make their big break. Um, so how do you feel about that? Because you know we talk about the Bushes, right? Oh, Kyle Bush, who has been doing this for years. Kyle Bush. And then he'll come and race with the, we call them the little boys, the Xfinity races. And to me, is that really fair to have someone who has had all that experience race against these young boys? It's like to me it's not giving the younger ones a chance to win a race because you're having to fight against these pros that are coming kind of to me, they should stay in their own lane. Why do they get to come? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Take yeah. I, so NASCAR, I think, NASCAR's found a good happy medium by letting them do a certain amount of races. Because I could see for, I could definitely see both sides. Um, like from the fan perspective, if you're watching this cup guy come in and race the Xfinity Series and win every race, that's boring. That's boring. And Kyle Busch was doing that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever race he ran. 
<laughs> that to me was just not fair. That's like having a 600 pound wrestler, you know, fight against a 100 pound. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, in NASCAR stock car racing, there is no, you know, there's no license requirement for how much experience you have or how much you've done. And frankly, for me, as a driver and who has gotten waxed by Kyle Busch, um, I'm glad I get to get waxed by Kyle Busch. I would rather go out and get beat by the best drivers than race against guys who are in the same equipment but aren't as the same caliber as Kyle Busch. So it's kind of a catch-22, you know, like for the fan perspective and for watching it from the outside and for having been a fan and watching it from the outside, I agree. But also as a driver, when you go to the track and you see Kyle Busch on the entry list or Kyle Larson or all these cup guys, like we were racing with Kyle Larson this past weekend at, Dar at Darlington and that was a really big battle with him and Sheldon Creed. You know, you're racing against the best drivers out there. I mean, these are world-class, world-class stock car drivers, and I get to share a track with them. And that's only gonna make me better if I get to race with him. So that's that's like the two sides of it. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, when you do beat him, yeah. exactly. <laughs> when you do beat him, it's better. It makes you look like Superman. So how does one move into the Cup Series? Money. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, um, obviously, realistically, the best way to do so is by having experience. You know, you want X amount of experience in Xfinity, X amount of, you know, wins. Like, if you, like, I have at this point 62 starts in Xfinity and I don't have a win. You know, but, you know, obviously that goes also by, you know, I drive for a smaller organization. We don't have the same stuff as all these guys. But at the same time, I don't know if I would, if I personally would make that jump to Cub because I haven't competed in a, for lack of better words, like a bigger team, like a Gibbs or a Junior or a Hendrick or a Penske, you know. So if I were to make that jump to Cub, I would rather do a few starts in a you know a highly competitive you know Xfinity car before doing so just to make sure that I know what it's like to compete at an elite level you know because there, there's a difference in that can you uh, explain a little bit about your uh, team JD Motorsports who they are and do they have more than one car uh, where they're located yeah, so I drive for JD Motorsports. JD stands for Johnny Davis. Um, Johnny's had cars in the Xfinity Series. This is actually our 20th anniversary. Um, he's been a car owner, like I mentioned, 20 years. Um, has had many drivers come through his stable. One notable, I mean, he's had very notable drivers come through. Landon Castle, uh, Ross Chastain, um, Brian, Ryan Priest. Um, many names who are ha who have a place in the sport, whether they're a driver or a crew member, has come through JD Motorsports, um, and so that's where I'm kind of trying to be. You know, I'm trying to, you know, I I've had my experience at JD. Now I'm, you know, doing, I'm doing all these races, and I'm getting a heck of a lot of experience, and it's been a great, great opportunity, and uh, it it definitely means a lot to work with a car owner like Johnny, um, and I have. Today, uh, last year we had four cars. This year we downsized to two cars to put more of our resources into the two, and we've definitely seen a performance increase. Uh, so it's me in the six car, and then the four car, which is Bailey Curry. You mentioned earlier uh, that you did some late models. Was that dirt late models? Uh, no pavement. I have yet to make a dirt start. I really want to do dirt, though. Have you ever run dirt? I have not. I actually, I, I lied. I've done one practice session in a dirt car. Um, and even then, it wasn't even a dirt car. It was a Legends car that was set up to do dirt. Why don't you talk about how many number six cars set up? Yeah, so um, for the six team, uh, the six car, we have, um, we have several different cars for several different types of track. We have two intermediate cars, intermediate cars, as I mentioned, intermediate tracks, as I mentioned, tracks bigger than a mile to two miles. Then we have a short track car, which is tracks for just for all those smaller tracks. We have a road course car and a super speedway car. Um, from there, we have backup cars. We have 
you know, basically just other cars kind of at our disposal if the worst happens. Uh, the worst being they get wrecked. Um, luckily, we haven't had to worry about that. So. Um, as far as when you were talking about Xfinity and then moving the cut, um, you know, it's not really your choice. Is it? Don't you usually get like a current cup team might have seen you perform and want to make you an offer to come to them? It's tough. I mean, it's tough nowadays. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of it, as I mentioned earlier, comes down to the business aspect. Um, it comes down to how good are you at marketing as well as driving. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these guys that are there today, you know, they are the best of the best marketers and drivers. Um, so it's about, as you mentioned, kind of putting yourself in front of these car owners. And so like, you know, when I'm out there racing as much as I am and getting the most out of my equipment, having days like Daytona where we finished sixth, car owners see that. Car owners see that, hey, he survived the minefield that was that Daytona race and finished sixth. He got the most out of that race car. Or when we go to Texas and finished eighth, wow, he outperformed, outperformed that, that, that day. You know, he outperformed all that, those other people. So that's what gets people, that's what gets car owners interested you know, when they see that you can deliver a clean car, but also deliver on the racetrack. Is there going to be a lot of pressure when you're talking about how you get your number of starts and no wins yet to, to actually get that win versus like, like say Harvard just came off a, a winless streak, the same as that, you know, I mean, I mean, a lot of drivers know that many races about wins. Is there a lot of pressure to win or is it more of a consistent performance? It's more the consistent performance at this time because, you know, like I mentioned, we're a smaller team, so we're not out there on a strategy to win. We're not out there with a car, you know, to go out there and win. But, you know, say a year from now, two years from now, if I'm in a car that's, you know, if I'm in a car that's like a Gibbs car or like a Penske car, I'm expected to win. And that's where that pressure of, that's where the pressure of winning comes in. Right now, I gotta worry about being consistent. Right now, I have to worry about being consistent and finishing races. That's my job, um, which, is a lot. I mean, it's a lot to think about because, especially when you're running, you know, in the thick of it, you know, a lot can go wrong. What can you tell us about the cars that you're driving? Various engines, or yeah. So, I mean, the only times we're ever restricted is obviously, uh, as I mentioned, Daytona. Um, Daytona being such a big track. Daytona and Talladega, um, and, and Atlanta now. We have, they have recently repaved Atlanta to make it a super speedway. Um, but they restrict us to 400 horsepower on those tracks to keep us at a safe speed. Um, and that safe speed is under 200, 220. Um, everywhere else we're unrestricted. Um, and that's where we hit, where our horsepower number is about, is, a, is about at 670 horsepower. What brand of engine with that? Uh, Chevrolet, um, yeah. Chevy's in your yeah. team? Yeah, our team is a Chevy team. Um, some teams run, you know, we have three manufacturers in NASCAR. We have Chevy, Ford, and Toyota. Um, in our series, we run the Camaro, the Mustang, and the Supra. A couple things. Is your roommate with JD also? No. No, he runs the 31 car. His name is Myatt Snyder. He races the 31 car for Jordan Anderson Racing. And do your parents get to see you often? And as far as us, it would be more fun to watch you through it. Oh no, yeah, no my, uh, my 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 parents get to go to a lot of races, um, especially during um, like the 2020 season when I got to do some races during that because obviously a lot was shut down and NASCAR was the first sport, the first you know professional sporting league to come back. So while my parents weren't working or doing anything, they were able to come to races, um, which was a um, a definite silver lining in what was 2020. Um, They've, one thing I've also promised my dad is I'd take him to every racetrack, and so far I've taken him to, I think, 80% of them. So I'm trying to finish that out next year, hopefully. How did you feel going down the back straightaway at Daytona when there was a giant wreck? So I'm going to explain that because I have a story. So we're coming to the white flag at Daytona. I had, we were in a second pack. So we obviously, as I mentioned, we're racing in packs. Um, our pack, I, I, let me back up five laps. Our second pack, they got stuck racing each other 
because they wanted to have the ego of leading the second pack. And I was like, okay, boys, we are losing the lead. <laughs> we need to get up there. So I get into the second lane, and I start shoving the guy who's in this lane, and we actually separate ourselves, and we catch the lead group um, with two to go. Finally, we get up to lead group, and then that's when I realized, man, we kind of, I'm finally going, but it's a little too late. Like, I'm not going to be able to make any, any ground here. It's three wide. Everybody's bunched up from the bottom of the track all the way to the wall. Um, take the white flag. I'm in the, I'm in the outside lane, outside lane being where the wall is. And uh, I'm riding there. And in my mind, I think to myself, I'm riding 18th. That is not worth destroying a race car. And I drop to the bottom of the racetrack. So I drop to the bottom of the racetrack just because I know that they're gonna crash. And sure enough, I see my roommate's roof. And like, so one thing that is, that I'll mention is, when we're racing at Daytona, we're going 195 miles an hour. Your American Airlines jet plane that you guys go flying on, they take off at 160. So if any air gets under this small, in comparison to a jet plane, race car, it's gonna fly. And sure enough, when he got turned, some air got underneath his car, and his car took off and did a somersault like that. And so I see his roof, and immediately I, I just basically said, nope, and went to the left and went into the grass. And I see flames. I see cars flying. There, like Everyone who was in that pack crashed, except for me and maybe two other cars. I just went to the grass, spun out, and one thing that you don't see a lot or you don't see talked about is when you're spinning, you don't see anything. You don't know what's happening, you don't know what's going on, so I'm spinning. I have my hands off the wheel doing this because if somebody hits the steering wheel, that could easily rip off a thumb. Um, so uh, if somebody hits the front tires, it can jerk the wheel out of my hands and hurt your wrist or hurt your thumb. So I'm doing that, I'm spinning, I'm looking, I'm seeing where I'm at. I'm like, okay, I have control, I'm, I have control, I have control, I'm spinning, spinning, spinning. And I, then suddenly I see my teammate and I'm coming for him. <laughs> you can imagine the, the panic I had. I turned right, I almost spun out. He kept sliding up. I'm like, oh God. So I turned back left like that, barely missed him. So if you want to know what it's like crashing at Daytona, just, um, I don't know. Ugh. It's bad. It's not fun. They they advertise they but they don't advertise as how bad it hurts. It hurts. It's still a car crash. Now you said you have certain types of cars. Is this car a super speedway this weekend or is it an intermediate? Intermediate, yeah. We'll run an intermediate car for this one. Um, the only the only times we use a super speedway car is for Daytona or Talladega. Um, it's been kind of debated recently for Atlanta because they did that big repave. Um, but essentially what we do there is we still bring an intermediate car and just change some of the suspension, you know, setup that we do for that race just because it's still, while it's, while it races like a super speedway, you still set it up like an intermediate. It's weird. I did a horrible job explaining that, but yeah. Do you not have spotters that tell you, say, turn left? I mean, even in Xfinity, do you not have the spotters? Oh, yeah. No, we have, we have spotters. But we have spotters, but when you're in a pack like that, they see what you see, essentially. Um, that's, but they definitely are a big, big help, especially for, like, when you're catching a car, they can tell you, hey, they're running the bottom of the track. Run that line. Try it this lap. And you run that line, and you're suddenly two tenths faster that lap. Okay, that's the line I need to run. And that's what I did this past weekend at Darlington. How does the money work? You have to pay a, an entry fee for, your, for you to be able to race. And then, I mean, like if you got sixth, are you in the money? Or if you got 18th, are you in the money? How does the money work? So to get into racing, you need to have X amount of dollars, you know, sponsorship wise, personal money wise, whatever you have. So a lot of what I do is I have to find sponsorship to go and race. Um, and that, you know, that money obviously goes to the team to help them, you know, basically build the car, you know, help them get the tires they need, the suspension components, brake components, whatever they need. That's what that goes to. And that gives them a reason to go out there and not operate at a loss. 
um, operating at a loss essentially is you go out there and finish 30th plain and simple and that's also and you know it's it's so important it's so under talked about how important it is to come home with a clean car like with no damage on it because if you do that you at least didn't put yourself and your team in a bad spot where you're having to spend time fixing a car when instead you could be yeah and money where you could spend time and money fixing a car where instead you could be spending it making it better so within your team is there like a hierarchy of who gets paid okay this much money comes in driver gets this much and this much eh, not really not necessarily yeah it's pretty even all the way through i mean obviously you know there's managers and stuff like that so but for the most part it's pretty even so uh, sort of to uh build on her question how much are the entry fees there's no well there are entry fees to get in to like enter your car so if you were to enter an xfinity car into a race there is an entry fee i don't know what that entry fee is um and also the entry i should say entry the cost to race varies from team to team um you know some teams charge in the mid to lower you know hundreds other teams are in the 200s hundred thousands um so it's a lot of money so you have a financial officer who takes care of that for you <laughs> no i'm a one-man band i don't sleep <laughs> The average cost for tires per race is we go through about four to five sets of tires. One set of tires costs twenty five hundred dollars, and you burn and you use that one time and one time only. Um, and so you think it's a four or five set race. That's twelve thousand five hundred dollars that you are immediately spending when you show up to the track. That's before you've raced. You see a lot of the race use stuff now on the market, like tires and body parts and stuff. Does your team do that too when you have stuff that's not good? Do you sell that off? Yeah, like we have deals where we, yeah, we have deals where we, you know, offer body parts to ex manufacturers or, or ex, you know, um, like the Racing Warehouse is a company out in North Carolina that does that stuff. Um, they offer to buy the parts off us and then they sell it. Or whatever, so. So they don't all just get junk necessarily. Yeah, but they they all serve their own. They all serve their own purpose. I hate to cut it short, but he has to get rested. We don't want to be the reason he <laughs> on Saturday. Um, let's hear it for Ryan. Yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, Thank you guys all for coming. Thank you guys for supporting um, Midwest Dream Car Collection. I know you guys, a majority, if not all of you, are locals. Um, thank you guys, like I said, for supporting them, for interacting with me. Um, I'm glad that we had the showing that we had tonight. So thank you guys. Um, it was great to meet all you guys. Um, I'll be hanging out for a little while. So if you guys have any questions or anything, you know, feel free to ask. Yeah. Yes.